thank you for the introduction. And I'll jump right in and tell you about um, how we do things in Alibaba. And for a lot of times, for researchers in the industry, we have to make a choice. It's an either or choice between trying to impact real products or making cutting edge research. For a lot of reasons, it doesn't always align together. And in, us in Alibaba, I want to show how we're in our lab in Israel, we're able to actually merge the two, find the harmony between the, the two of them, and then we're able to actually do cutting edge research, advanced science, as well as having real impact on our products. So let me start the story by telling you a bit about Alibaba. Alibaba has a lot of branches, but one of them, we have multiple um, consumer applications that are targeting hundreds of millions of consumer. For example, we have the Yuku, which is a video platform, Alipay, which is known for payments, but it's much more than that. We have Taobao, which is a business to consumer e-commerce platform. We have Idlefish, which is a consumer to consumer platform, and, and many more. And all of them are serving hundreds of millions of consumers, and we want to make those, those consumers' lives better using AI and using our models. Now, there are a couple of challenges trying to do that uh, in dot scale and, and working with users. And one of those challenges is having to work with real world data. We can train our models on, on data which we collect, but then when it comes to the real life, there is a data and concept drift which we can't control. A lot of times our data is imbalanced, it's weakly labeled, even incorrectly labeled, and so on, and that's one serious challenge. Another challenge is having multiple objectives. We don't only focus on high accuracy as we can do in academic work. We have to balance between accuracy, uh, resource usage, the explainability, the ability to train and retrain, and so on. And finally, in a lot of cases, we have real users using our real apps, doing interaction with them. We need to understand their intent. We want to be interactive. We sometimes want to get feedback for them. Sometimes we have to work without getting this feedback, and so on. And today, I'm going to show how analyzing our products, analyzing the user needs, we can come up with very interesting research to topics, do the research, advance the science, and then go back and impact the products. So let me start with the first problem, which is talking about real world data. And uh, what I'm going to talk about, which you want to do for the users, is helping them do, look for images in their albums. They want to find an image which they find interesting or they want to remember. And for that, we need to be able to know what's inside each image. Now, each of those images may have multiple objects, so we want to be able, to, through our models, to find out what each image shows. So for example, this one is a cat. These are people who are snorkeling, and this is bread and table and so on. Now, when we look at such data sets, uh, which we want to train on, we have some very challenging problems. One of them is that we have uh, very few positive training samples for each class versus a whole lot of negative examples. The negative samples dominate because we only have a few images of each class we want, but we have millions or hundreds of thousands of images of other classes. There's also imbalance between the different classes. Some classes, such as person, are much more common than, let's say, snorkels. So there's a lot of difference between the classes. But today I want to talk about how we can tackle the issue of the negative samples over dominating the positive ones or the imbalance between the two. So normally you would try to train your network using the cross entropy loss. But when we do that and look at the logics at the end of the network, telling for each class whether it's supposed to be negative or positive, and looking at the confidence of the network, we can see there's a big difference. Looking at the graph, the orange line shows the network's confidence in its prediction for negative examples. We see that quickly goes up to one and stays there, which means the network saturates on those samples. Whereas for the sub positive samples, the blue line, we see it never really reaches the same height. It only reaches to around 0 0.8. And there's quite a gap between the confidence of the network in those two types of predictions. And this is an indication that the network does not extract all the information that it can from those positive examples, from those rare positive examples. So what do we do about it? A normal solution is trying to apply the focal loss, which, uh, which adds a decay factor over this so-called confidence and in order to uh, focus on the interesting samples. But if you look at the graph, we still see there is a still a big gap. When we propose the asymmetric loss, we see that it actually closes the gap, indicating that we are maximizing the information we can extract from the network. So what does this asymmetrical loss do? We add two items over the original focal loss. First, the decay factor, instead of being symmetric for the negative and positive examples, we change it and we make it different for the positive and negative ones. 
the decay factor of the negative samples is stronger, making, making the network learn more from each of the positive samples relative to a negative sample. Another thing we're doing is we're thresholding the probability for the negative samples only, if you can see the use of PM. By doing that, we're effectively taking the, the negative samples with very high confidences out of, this, out of the consideration so they don't affect our gradients. Let's eat a bit more detail. Let's look at which gradients are, effect, are created by this loss function. We're only focusing on the negative samples here, which are the dominating number of, of samples. And we plot here the gradient that is created by the loss function for each probability of negative sample. And we see the comparison between the cross entropy, the focal loss, and the asymmetric loss which we're proposing in green. We look at the gradients first, we see they're continuous, which is uh, obviously uh, a wanted behavior when you're trying to train your network. And then we can see there are three distinct areas. So for the small probabilities for the negative samples, which are the high confidences, those are thresholded. They're not affecting the gradients at all. For the middle part, which is where the network is about to make a mistake on those, net, on those samples by telling it's a positive example, even though it's negative, we see very hard, high gradients coming up to push the network in another direction. And finally, for the very high probabilities, those are again thresholded with the gradients disappearing, and this could be seen as maybe avoiding mislabeled samples or even thresholding those hard negatives so they won't drive the network away from working on the positive ones. Looking at some results, we open source this code. You can go ahead and download it and integrate it into your network. It's quite easy. And we can see that uh, on a, a lot of data sets, a lot of public data sets, it is outperforming the state of the art. And you can see the papers with code is the state of the art on Pascal Voc, MS Coco, Newswide, and Open Images. So feel free to go ahead and try it and see if it could help for you if you're also suffering from positive negative imbalance. Another issue I talked about in the beginning is having to work interactively with real users. And for this, I want to talk about image editing, or in this case, image uh, object deletion. We want to help the users modify images that they have. Maybe they want to delete something, uh, someone they don't want to remember, or some object that is, not, uh, is making the picture look less, uh, less enjoyable. And you want to offer them a friendly user interface so they can do it with a click or with marking the area they want to do. And remember, it's a cell phone. Nobody will do it um, very accurately. So I want to make it easy for them and do all the work by our AI. So this requires us to have a very good object segmentation, able to really understand what they want to delete. We don't want to delete too much, but we definitely don't want to delete too little. We want to be able to do in-painting in a very wild scenario. We don't know if it's going to be an outdoor scene, an indoor scene, uh, in the dark, and so on. And finally, it has to be interactive. It needs to run in real time so the user can uh, get feedback immediately and maybe follow up. In this part, I'm going to talk about uh, what it means to do in-painting in the wild, which we don't know which images we're going to work on and which mask we're going to work on. So we start from the image. We run semantic segmentation that will give us a very good uh, segmentation of the background and telling us which, which object is which. And we allow the user to select, as I said, either by just clicking or by marking, and we end up with the mask that we want to use. This is fed into the in-painting algorithm, which then fills the mask and creates a new output image. So that mask already poses a big challenge. Uh, it's a free-form mask. It's not like a rectangular mask, which we used to see in in-painting papers. And as a standard research process, we started our work by doing a literature survey and looking what is out there. And we found the state of the art from ICCB 2019, um, which one of their innovation was using soft gating or for the convolutions. What this helps is instead of using hard gating for the convolutions, which only affects the first layer, the soft gating is a trainable uh, layer of the network, and it, and it does soft gating between 0 and 1. This allows to propagate the information about the mask deeper into the network and have better effects on the in-painting and understanding what's background and foreground. In addition, one important uh, aspect is having structure versus details. In those holes that you fill, especially if the mask is large, you want to maintain the sense of structure in the background. But you don't want to only do structure, you want to keep it very detailed to create the textures that look like the rest of the image and make sense. And finally, of course, you want to avoid those artifacts. So that same paper is using a two-stage approach, starting with a coerced stage using the gated convolution and another thing called the elated gated convolutions which are basically convolutions which have a larger receptive field. 
these receptive fields allow them to bring in information from different scales and different distances and therefore do the completion of the background. The outputs of that chorus stage are then fed into a fine-tuned stage, which in itself has two parts. One part is another part for dilated convolutions, which is trying to do filling with more detail. And the second part is using attention, trying to find similar patches in the background to take the content from and paste into the inpainted region. Finally, those two paths are merged, and the output image is fed during training into the discriminator, which attempts to help the network train itself. Now, this is state-of-the-art and achieves very good results. But if you look at a lot of cases where, especially if the mask is large, this network tends to create artifacts. And those artifacts are very not wanted when you're trying to serve something for a customer. They will be very disappointed to see images like that. So we started analyzing and, and see what we can do better in order to avoid these trade-offs between structure and detail. And what we developed is a pyramid gun, which has already been seen for ge uh, generating images, but for in-painting, uh, we believe it's novel. And we start from the image and the mask, and we downscale them for each layer of the pyramid. Then we take the most coerced level of the pyramid and feed it into a generator, which in the end outputs an in-painted image for the coerced level. When we go up to the next level of the pyramid, that's where things get a bit more interesting. We feed it both the original image, the original image and mask downscaled to this level of pyramid and upsampling of the result from the most coerced level of the pyramid. Those two are then merged and, merged, and let's see how that happens. So zooming in, we're starting from the same structure of network and feeding the original image downscaled into the coerced stage of the network to do the in-painting. However, in the fine-tuning stage, that's where things change a bit. The output from the coerced stage is fed only to the dilated convolution path, whereas the uh, attention path is fed by the image from the, uh, from the previous layer in the pyramid. We believe that by taking the previous layer from the pyramid, we do better attention by allowing the structure to be more, more ready to find the, the correct results where to bring the, image, the patches from the rest of the background. Once we, do, once we combine the two using the same layer, we get an output for this layer, and this is fed into a discriminator for this specific layer as well. Going back to the pyramid, we can see that we do indeed have a discriminator for each layer of the pyramid, and we repeat this process step by step for all the layers of the pyramid. Now, it's a, compli it's a complicated generation scheme with a discriminator for each level, and we end up training everything together at once. We found out that it is better to train everything at once rather than trying to train each network consecutively. One more interesting thing we found out that because of the importance of the uh, high-level structure, it is best to give more weight in the last term to the most coerced level in the pyramid, the, the one with the smallest image, uh, over the rest of the layers. And this will give you the best trade-off between structure and detail and will help the network converge. So some more context. Um, when we try to delete uh, some object, we usually have the, from the semantic segmentation some good info about the background. So we know, for example, we have the, yellow wo the, the wall which is marked in yellow or the floor which is marked in red. And this could give us a very good indication where we want to take the pixels to fill in the information. So we use this semantic segmentation as a guidance map to affect the attention stage, which I've shown before. And in fact, we're not taking pixels from anywhere in the image, but only based on the guidance map when we want to complete the whole. And finally, we found that adding a contextual loss between the original image and the in-painted image to the overall loss mechanism improves the quality by a bit more. So let me summarize everything together. We started from an image. We wanted to make it as easy for our user to edit it as possible. So we did semantic segmentation. And then using a pyramid gun, the, softed, the, the gated convolutions, and the guidance, and the contextual loss, we generated an output image which is uh, pleasant and actually usable. So let's look at a couple of examples. So we show you a comparison to one to the state of the art from 2019. You can find more in our upcoming paper. But when we also compare, we want to compare to not only state of the art academically, but also to the state of the art apps, which are our competitors in the market. So we have this example of this couple walking uh, along the beach. Probably they split up and we want to delete the, the guy from there. And then zooming in, we can find that we have, uh, that our method is able to keep more detail, uh, does not create any artifacts or blurry, even though it's quite a large area to fill in. Here's another example of this couple which we want to remove and get just a beautiful view of the city. 
And again, we can see how our method is able to reconstruct the facades of the buildings, keep maintaining both the detail and the overall structure without creating artifacts. My last part of the talk is talking about multiple objectives. And the thing is that we want to deploy many networks. It's not just one task that we want to work on. We, want, we have many tasks. Not only we have many tasks, we have many hardwares we need to, to deploy to. It could be the server. It could be different types of mo mobile phones. It could be low end, high end, with specific hardware, not specific hardware. And we sometimes have to trade off between the power consumption, the speed, and the, and the accuracy. And having all of those uh, trade offs, we don't want to do them one by one. We don't want them to do it separately for each task. We want some infrastructure that allows us to do it in a very organized way. So I'm going to talk about one of the works we have in this area, and that's platform aware pruning. And by pruning, I mean we take a network which we already trained to do what the task that we need, and then we want to make it smaller or more efficient, but, really start, but still try to maintain as much accuracy as possible. Uh, and, and we do that using the knapsack problem. I believe most of us learned about the knapsack problem in sometimes in algorithms one. For those who don't remember, it's a problem where you have a set of items. Each of them has its own value, but also its own weight. And you want to take into your bag the items with as much value as possible, but you're limited by the, by the weight that the bag can handle. Or in the network pruning sense, you want to maximize the accuracy of your pruned network while you're, while you're limited by a computing budget. So the, the knapsack problem is formulated as maximizing the values of the items you choose. The, the items are marked by x. It's a binary variable. And in our case, the values of them are the estimated importance of every channel. You can go to our paper to see how that value is estimated. But you're limited by the total weight that you're allowed to carry. And that weight is not an approximation, but it's an actual cost you can measure of each channel on your target device. You do it once, and then you have it for all your devices. And you're limited by your computing budget. This is a dynamic programming problem. And when you can solve it, you solve it. It's not a very big one, too. And you solve it, and then you get a map of which channels you want to keep and which channels you want to discard. And you know that you're already feeding into the cost uh, to your budget cost. Then we want to do a bit of improvement to the quality, because once we prune the network, we might want to adjust the weights. And we do that using inner knowledge distillation, which means we're retraining the network and trying to improve the weights. But we're using the original network for this training as well. We start from the original network on top and the pruned network on the bottom. And due to our formulation, we, get that we have the same structure of network. We have the same number of layers, only with a different number of convolutions in each layer. And we want to be able to, to use the original network to teach the pruned network what the outputs from each layer should look like. So we're taking the feature maps from the, from the original network and the feature maps of the pruned networks, and we require them to be similar by adding an image neural distillation loss for each of those layers. Now, of course, they're not from the same dimension, so we need to add some linear projection to match those dimensions between the, we take the difference. We repeat that for each of the layers, and even summarize over, or even sum over all the layers, and end up with the, knowledge, the inner knowledge distillation loss, which is a summary of this uh, projection error over all layers, coupled with the, the cross entropy loss, for example. Now, it's important to note those linear projections are also trained using the fine tuning and then discarded. They're no longer necessary. So let me talk a bit about the results. What does the do, what does the do does for us? So we can see this graph. This graph is showing the accuracy of a network versus the computing that it requires. And the black dots are commonplace networks like exception, inception v3, and so on. The red, the red line is combining the ResNet 101, where the full red circle is the original ResNet 101 trained, and the empty circles are each one of the pruning we can do to different uh, trade-offs between computing and accuracy. The full blue dot is the ResNet 50, which is, again, ResNet 50 fully trained. And then I want to compare this uh, empty red circle, which I'm pointing to the arrow to, and that's taking the ResNet 101 and pruning it. And we compare it to the fully trained ResNet 50, which is down and to the right. And what this shows us is that our pruning network, our pruning method, allows us to get both better accuracy and less computing than just training ResNet 50 from, the sc from scratch. We also opened, uh, and this is a, a good way to maybe say that you want to overtrain your network and then prune it to get better results. We also open source this code. It's state of the art. You can go ahead and use it for your networks. So let me summarize. 
I started our story by talking about the consumer apps that Alibaba has and is serving hundreds of millions of, of consumers. Based on those apps, we analyzed our users' needs, what they need, what are the problems, what we can do for them, how we can give them value, and, and analyzed how our research can benefit those users. From that, we defined the research problems and, uh, and came up with solutions and ended up both publishing those solutions and fitting them back into the product in order to uh, give the influence to the users. Thank you. So thank you very much, Matan. That was very educating about how to have quality creativity into the products that you do. And we wanted to ask you a question. Um, you know, you're a part of a research lab. How do you find that next topic to research? Do you get it from your product team? Um, it's a very good question. Um, we are a research lab, or part of the Research Institute, but we're still very much a product-minded team. And we have a very strong product team here in Israel and a very strong engineering team here in Israel. And all of us collaborate together by looking at the products, looking at our users, understanding, understanding which, uh, which problems we want to solve, and which, uh, which research will do the best for them. And we do this very collaboratively, analyzing what would bring the most value, and then we come up with a decision about what we want to do research. Then our research team goes ahead, solve the problem, sometimes even doing collaborations with the academy and bringing, uh, bringing real uh, impact on science, and we feed it back into the uh, products themselves. 